this computer. Okay, and we're starting. Hello, and welcome to another wonderful episode of New York City Category Theory Seminar. This week, we have Sina Hatsratapur. He's going to pronounce it right. And he's talking about fiber categories in Lean 4. So we're looking forward to that. Anyways, take it away. Four, four okay, things. Okay. Where, where were you born? Where did you get your bachelor's degree? Where did you get your higher degree? Where you are now? Go. So, yeah, my name is, uh, as you mentioned, Sina Hazratpur. Uh, I, I was born in, uh, in an island in Iran. It's, uh, it's a Peshma island in Persian Gulf. Um, I did my bachelor's degree in Iran, although in a different city. It's the uh, city of Mashhad is sort of like northeast province, Khorasan. Um, then I did my master's in uh, Western Ontario in Canada, my PhD in University of Birmingham in UK. And... I'm currently a postdoc at Johns Hopkins with Emily Real. Um, currently, I'm speaking from Netherlands. Uh, that's essentially, I mean, that's my country of in citizenship, essentially. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, today I want to talk about fiber categories in Lean 4, which is a proof assistant that is getting more popularity these days. Um, there is some box on my screen. I don't know if you are seeing it says this meeting is being recorded and that's not going away. So let me try to fix that first. Um, okay, I got it now that it's recorded. So uh, yes, uh, there's a repository of uh, mechanized proofs uh, of fiber categories in Lean. So these are essentially Lean code, uh, which checks that all the constructions and all the proofs are correct. Um, so I, I shared the link uh, online, so you can you can go there and, and if, if you like to follow it now or later, uh, so that's the link for you. It's uh, github.com, uh, synhp, lean fiber categories. Um, so so what is, so for people who are familiar perhaps with lean, uh, maybe, maybe these slides are going to be a little bit boring, but for the people who have not heard of interactive theorem provers, uh, so here's a list of, uh, interactive theorem provers more or less in chronological orders. Um, so we had Mizard and Metamath, then we had uh, Hall, which is short for higher order logic light. Uh, we had Isabel, Agdog, Cock, and more recently Lean. Uh, and basically what they are is like computer software wherein you write uh, your sort of like mathematics in, in a certain language that the software supports. And uh, what the software tells you is whether what you have constructed is correct and what, whatever you have proved is correct. So it basically checks your proofs. Um, so among all of these proof assistants, by far Lean has now the most math content and uh, uh, math lib4, which is the standard mathematical library of Lean, is now reaching 1.5 million lines of code. Uh, I haven't checked recently. Maybe it already has passed. I when I prepared my slides um, uh, two weeks ago, uh, I mean, that was roughly the, the number of lines. Um, by the way, before I forget, I should mention that this talk is going to be interactive. So feel free at any time to, to um, interrupt and ask any question that you might have. Thank you. Um, so what... So there are different ways to think of uh, uh, interactive theorem provers. Um, uh, I would like to think of them as sort of, comp still they are very complicated softwares because they can be quite finicky and very unforgiving at times. Um, and we will see some of this soon. Um, the way that I think of them as basically as a sort of medium to organize my, my ideas and my logical reasoning at a very extreme level of detail. Um, and then we can think of this as a strict friend, which basically checks every step of your proof and it reminds me, it reminds you of any leaps or gaps in your reasoning that you might have. Um, and like, I think of like definitions in the system as sort of like promises that uh, you give to the system. And then once you want to Prove properties about those definitions. The system is going to keep you to your promises, and, and like it's not letting you go on until like you check every step of the proof. Um, so the question is like, why do we want such a strict friend? Like when we do mathematics, why, why 
what's the benefit of having such thing? Well, the obvious thing is that, uh, what many people have already mentioned in the past from Vladimir Wovotsky to uh, another Fields medalist Peter Schultz uh, and many other people is basically, uh, it's very likely that one can do a mistake in mathematical reasoning, um, especially when the kind of mathematics that we do, it gets more and more complicated and we have to carry more uh, data in our head. Uh, it's good to have a system to sort of cognitively offload some of the burden that we carry all the way when we build that sort of complexity. Um, uh, another reason is uh, this kind of systems. Um, so 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 they, they they give you a certificate essentially. So so all of your proofs are going to be correct by construction. Uh, so that's the first reason, and maybe the most important reason. The second reason is um, they make possible large scale collaborations. Um, because everything that we have to construct in the systems is going to be uh, type checked and the correctness is going to be checked. Uh, that makes large collaboration quite possible. And this software of Lean especially supports such collaboration. So there has been projects in Lean where uh, five, six, sometimes up to 10 people have collaborated onto a, on one project. And this is uh, simply not uh, feasible in without such systems, just pen and paper kind of mathematics. Um, another reason is for teaching. I have benefited, uh, I've been teaching uh, introduction to proofs at Johns Hopkins, which is a sort of upper level undergraduate course. And um, it has had like huge effect in terms of like students learning and a student getting engaged, seeing kind of like proofs as games, um, but also like, you know, having a friend where uh, they can actually interact learning mathematics, even though, even in situations when I'm not there, they can always interact with the system and learn from the system. And of course, it has made uh, aspects of the course quite different from grading to like the kind of like psychological dynamic of the course. Um, so I think it has been a positive force. Uh, I, I don't want to go into too much into that, but if you have questions about this uh, either research component of doing mathematics in Lean or the teaching, I, I'm happy to answer that uh, at the end. Um, so most of these systems are based on type theory and the fundamental paradigm is checking the correctness of a proof of a theorem is essentially getting reduced to type checking. So that means a certain term has the right type. Um, it's a property of lean in particular that it's based on something called extensional dependent type theory. So if you have heard of dependent type theory, then you perhaps uh, understand what I'm talking about. If not, then uh, at this point, uh, I don't think I'm going to uh, like go into much detail about this. Um, but uh, it's it's important to know that the choice of type system has sort of very immediate consequences for the kind of mathematics one can do and the way that we can do those kind of mathematics. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about fiber categories, uh, which is part of category theory library in Lean. Um, and uh, we can see that extensional dependent type theory of Lean has, has very, um, as important consequences for the way we can do category theory in Lean. So uh, let me just very quickly summarize uh, what, what simple versus dependent type theory means for category theory. So, so in the left column, you can see uh, that I'm defining a sort of like uh, cat category object in, uh, so I'm defining the uh, a structure of category essentially in, in Lean. So I, I just for fun called it simple cat. Uh, these are not official names. This is just for purpose of demonstration. Um, so simple cat has two types, has a type of objects and has a type of morphisms. And if you have not heard of type theory before, you can think of types as sort of collections. And then we have two operations or functions in this case, which are domain and codomain. They associate to a morphism respectively their domain and their codomain. And then we have another operation, which for every object, you have an identity morphism. Um, 
And then, as we know from category axioms, we have to satisfy certain axioms, uh, compatibility between these three operations of domain, codomain, and identity. Um, so that's the way that we have two types and a bunch of operations between them. There is no dependency, essentially. Whereas in the right-hand side, you have, um, again, we want to capture the data of a category, but in a different way this time. We have a type of objects, um, and then we have a type of morphism, which is dependent on this type of objects. So given any two objects, um, x and y, I have a type of morphisms from x to y. Um, and then I have to, uh, I have two operations, identity, um, which are, again, these are dependent functions. Um, so, uh, so identity, depending on which uh, input you give to it, um, lands in a different type. So identity of X will be a term of type morphisms from X to X, whereas identity of Y will be in a different type, uh, which is morphisms from Y to Y. And similarly, you have a dependent uh, function for, for or operation for composition of morphisms. And then I drew these pictures to show like that you have two layers, essentially. The first layer maybe is for the type of objects. And uh, depending on any two objects in the base, you have a type of morphism. So I, I would like to pause a little bit here if, if there are questions or. Well, well, yeah, one second. Where do you say that the dependent type is a category? It, um, it, it, oh, so no, I'm sorry. Where do you say that? So, so, so far in either of the cases, like maybe in the dependent case, we are just defining what the structure of category is. Right, what a category structure is. So a category a structure consists of a type of objects, a dependent type of morphisms, two operations, identity and composition. And I haven't list uh, the axioms, for example, associativity of composition. So you would say like something is a category if you give a term of the type dependent cat, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so so uh, the base is is just a type it's not a category and uh, the base is just a type that's right it's type of objects um but this uh, new type that we are defining like dependent cat if you have seen uh so these are sometimes called record types or if you have seen uh, sigma types these are like you know a gigantic sigma type which has like type of objects type of morphism dependent on objects and so on and so forth so if you get a, give a term of the type dependent cat, it means you are providing all this data. Okay. Well, by the way, intuitively, is dependent cat is a little bit like right, a little bit like when you have enriched cats, where now what the homs are could depend on. So. Uh, I agree. So, so this way of encoding uh, the dependent way of encoding the structure of a category is very similar to the way that we do enriched category theory. So in fact, if you write category as a category enriched in set, this is the kind of formulation you would get. So U and V are parameters. Uh, correct. So U and V here uh, are the sort of like uh, the sizes uh, of, of, so they're the so-called universe uh, sizes. Uh, so U means like, uh, so I'm fixing, a size for the type of objects or the collection of objects, how big they can be. And V would, would be for any two X and Y, I'm saying the hum X, Y, how large this can be. So you and V essentially uh, control whether your category is going to be a small, locally a small. Uh, and, and we need to talk about these things because uh, size matters actually. But then we want to talk about category theory in. Uh, in, in very exact way, size matters, and doing things in a proof assistant means we are forced to actually talk about sizes. Okay, good, good. Um, okay, uh, then, uh, so maybe one more remark here is if just uh, by comparing the two sides, I mean, I haven't listed all the axioms on the left hand side nor on the right hand side. But what I have listed so far is these two parts are equivalent, like all the data of 
the left is captured in the right. Uh, so for example, you might think where is the domain, right? Well, if you think about a morphism at all on the right-hand side, the domain is basically the first input that uh, uh, the, the function more gets. Uh, and then the, the codomain will be the second argument. So these are already encoded in the dependent way. So we can appreciate actually that how uh, concise the, the dependent formulation is. And actually this matters in formalization because uh, oftentimes you want to provide, like say like this type has the structure of category, right? I can put the under, type, let's say type of natural numbers. So the, you can say like there's a morphism from one natural number to the other if it's less than or equal to the other one, right? So, so therefore you, if you want to provide like make that into a category, you do have to provide all these single data essentially. And it's good to have uh, less uh, data in your record time because then you have to do less. Um, okay. So, so um, I, I want to give you like a taste of category theory before we, we, we move on, like how one actually does um, in, in any uh, like category theory or in its poor persistence. So, so I want to switch to my uh, uh, lean prover uh, momentarily. So here I have a lean file opened. Um, and um, so I, I imported a bunch of things from like lean standard library. So you can see like I have imported like uh, you need a lemma from mathlib here. Uh, uh, I mean, not all of these things are necessary for a presentation today, but this is basically how you import some stuff. Um, and here, uh, so I'm saying C is a type. Now you notice that I haven't said like of which uh, universe, like I could have said U, right? And then my U, sh I, I should have declared it's a universe. Um, but you can also leave it open for lean to assign an arbitrary universe to this. So that's what type star does. And this is what we call universe polymorphism. Uh, so, so I will get to this uh, after the demonstration, but just just uh, just so that you know what this type of star is. I'm essentially leaving up to link to to assign some universe level to C. Um, and then I say I have a structure of category on C. So that means um, so if you look at category C by controlling on uh, by clicking on this, I actually go to a file in uh, Mathlib. Um, which defines what category is. Um, so this is basically that dependent uh, description of category structure that I was talking about. So here it lists the axioms of category, but then it says category is something, a category structure which satisfies this axiom. And then if I click on category structure, um, you can see that uh, that's, uh, uh, that comes with, uh, it's a quiver, which basically means type of objects and a dependent type of morphisms, which has these two functions, identity and com. So if you compile all this data, you get uh, the same thing that I was basically showing you in the slides. Um, so anyhow, um, we have C and we have as the category structure on C and we have like, I don't know, four objects in C. So that's what we say, right? So these are terms of type C essentially. Um, so this arrow notation is a way to say uh, it's short for harm essentially. So uh, x arrow y is just a notation for harm x y. Um, uh, so this harm is actually part of uh, uh, a data of category. And um, so yeah, so I want to do, do basically just one example, maybe. Uh, let me just skip to here. Um, so here I have, um, yeah, I think I went to the wrong file, but okay, yeah, we should be here, sorry. So um, I have defined uh, this predicate is monomorphism on the type of morphisms of C. So if I have a morphism from X to Y, uh, F 
I want to say f is a monomorphism if basically for any object z and any two morphisms x and x prime from z to x, if the composition of x with f is the same as composition of x prime and f, then x and x prime must be the same. So maybe just a short remark here uh, that this notation for composition um, uh, is actually the diagrammatic composition. Okay. Um, right. So any question about uh, definition or, or the notations, please feel free to interrupt, as I said before. Um, so what we want to show now is basically if I have uh, a monomorphism F and a monomorphism G, and that these two morphisms are sort of composable, then their composition is, um, again, a monomorphism. And this is just an example for demonstration so, so that uh, uh, if, if you have not seen uh, uh, interactive theorem prover, here here will be your first experience of it. Basically, can you um, possibly make the screen uh, the type larger? Absolutely. Is it better now? How about one more? That's great. One more. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Maybe one more. Okay. Good. So let me make it. Okay. So that's. Uh, that's the statement. So so here you can see when I write such a things. These are all become sort of like your hypothesis. And what comes after semicolon is your goal, what you want to prove. And then I put my, and one, and here after this, you actually want to give the proof. So you want now after by, I'm going to do the construction, which basically is like giving the proof. So uh, sorry is a placeholder, which says uh, for lean, like, you know, like uh, don't complain right now, because if I don't put the sorry, you know, like uh, suddenly I get this, the squiggly arrow, which says, you know, like I have unsolved goal, right? Uh, and what is my unsolved goal? Well, uh, here's my unsolved goal. It says that I have to prove f composed with g is a monomorphism. And before the turn style, these are all of my assumptions or hypotheses. So this is sort of like think of this as a lean's brain. Uh, it knows all about these things, and it wants to prove this. So I will do. The sequences of uh, so-called tactics, which either changes hypotheses or the goal. And the idea is to get a goal that is trivial at the end. So similar to a way that a mathematician proves this, right? Um, so maybe the first thing to do is like to say, okay, you know, like maybe what is this mono? Maybe we should unfold this. So, so you can do unfold is mono. This essentially just says, uh, says to lean, you know, go back to definition of is mono and unfold it like definitionally, what, what definition was. So you can see now before my goal was is mono. And after this, my goal is, you know, whatever is mono F is basically, um, which in particular starts with a universal quantifier. So if I want to say, you know, if I want to prove a universally quantified statement, which says for all Z in, in C, something is true, then I have to say, okay, take take an arbitrary z, right? Take an arbitrary z, take an arbitrary x and x prime. Um, so so we do this by this tactic intro. So we say, okay, you know, take uh, take an arbitrary element z and c, and take arbitrary x and x prime, which are morphisms to x. And also assume that uh, you know. So after this, my my goal is an implication. So it says if x composed with f composed with g is x prime composed with f composed with g, then x equals to x prime. Again, because you're trying to prove an implication, uh, you say, let's let the hypothesis of the implication be, be true. So you introduce some hypothesis h, and now you have added h to your context, which says, you know, uh, this composition is equal to this composition. And now you want to deduce that x is equal to x prime. Um, OK, uh, so what can we do here? Um, well, we know that uh, 
uh, f is a monomorphism, and we know that g is a monomorphism. So, um, so why not use monomorphism g to to deduce from h uh, to essentially cancel g in h, right? So to say that x composed with f is equal to x prime composed with f. Um, so I can then apply maybe hf um, at h. Oh, that doesn't work. So let's see. It doesn't work. But why? Why not? Um, so my idea was like you know I wanted to cancel g. So maybe I should use g here. But it still it doesn't work. It says failed to find this expression as the type of parameter of is mono g. Um, so um, so I want to come back to this after. Uh, so this is a little bit more advanced tactic. So I want to come back after this. But if I apply hg itself, uh, OK, that doesn't work. But apply hf works. So let's see. Um, so my goal is now x equals to x prime. But when I apply hf, my goal is now x composed with f is equal to x prime composed with f. So what's happening here is we are changing the goal backward. Like, if, if I know this, then hf, which is witness that f is a monomorphism, would prove for me that x is equal to x prime. So therefore, all I need to do is to prove this statement. So that becomes then my current goal. And uh, similarly, I can change my goal again, sort of like from uh, a sort of backward proof to this kind of a statement. Because now, uh, by, by, by G being monomorphism, I can deduce x composed with f is x prime composed with f. And basically, what your goal is very similar to your hypothesis h, except your goal is differently bracketed. So in h, uh, this uh, uh, sort of highlighting this shows that the bracketing is first around f and g. And then that is composed with x. Um, similarly here. So first is f and g are sort of uh, the, the binding is over f and g and then with x prime. So really, if I just say, you know, just copy h because uh, write exact h, right? I get an error which says, uh, well, h has type this, but it was expecting to have a different type. So these two equalities are actually different. So I cannot do exact h. But what I can do is um, change the bracketing in h, right? So I can use associativity to rebracket h. Um, or I can use associativity to rebracket the goal. So both are possible. So in this case, I just want to rebracket the goal, right? So I can say rewrite as um, so if I do that, you can see that in the goal, now I have a different rebracketing on the right-hand side. And if I do it again, then, uh, yeah, so, so sorry. The first one actually rebracketed the left-hand side. And the second one also rebracketed the right-hand side. And now my goal looks exactly like what H is proving. So I can just say, you know, exact H. So uh, then we are done with it. So th there is no goal to prove, essentially. So this was like a short demonstration on what, what, what it's like to prove uh, um, like a simple statement in link. But I would like, again, to pause here if there are questions. Um, unfortunately, I cannot monitor chat. So if, if there's a question, maybe you, know, so you can uh, let me know. No, there's nothing in the chat right now. Okay, but, but it's okay. very understandable. It's very nice. Go. Um, right. So this this part that didn't work was actually uh, so that was uh, a way, way to do 
uh, forward proof rather than backward proof. So in this case, uh, you know, I wanted to, instead of changing the goal, you can change the hypothesis uh, age. Um, uh, but again, like maybe here first, we needed to re-bracket age for this to work, right? So maybe we needed to do like uh, rewrite a sock, a sock uh, at age. And here we are going to do like backward association. So, so you can see our age changed the bracketing. And maybe now we can actually apply one the fact that G is a monomorphism to, to H. What about, so let's see what happens here. You see, so our H became simple. Uh, so this is going to be sort of, let me comment out the backward proof and let's do a forward proof as well. Um, and now again, I can apply H F at H. And this time I change my hypothesis so that they look like my goal. And now I can do, uh, sorry, uh, exact age. Okay, so, so this was a forward proof and, and the one before was backward. Good. Um, so there's more in this file. So there's a proof of Yoneda lemma, uh, um, but so that was, uh, this file was something that I prepared for, for another talk essentially. Uh, so um, I want to stop here and just go back to the, the, the presentation. At the end, if there's time, I'm happy to also do a demo here you know, later. Um, right. Uh, so I have a question. Absolutely. Uh, the association, um, I guess that association operation, how do you, um, uh, like for example, uh, we know there's associations and categories, right? How do you specify hmm. that? Did you specify that for the category type and that's why you're able to use it? Right, exactly. So if I actually uh, click on this ASOC, uh, it leads me to this Oh, axiom. I see, you have that. Got it. I have that, that's part of the definition of category structure, right? And mm -hmm. because uh, we sort of like, um, we said C is a category. So any object and morphism of C has to obey those kind of axioms that C has. So then this mm -hmm. asset becomes uh, becomes available, right? So okay. we do a test. We can, we can actually remove this category structure and see, let's just say a type. So the first error we get is like, first of all, what does a more like, what is a morphism from mm -hmm. X to Y? Lynn doesn't know. And then like the first error is like a morphism, so it doesn't make sense. Um, but like, instead of category, we could have say, okay, we have a category a structure without the axiom, right? Um, and the morphisms make sense because a category structure has harm. It just doesn't have those axioms. And you can see the first error that you get is for ASOC. It don't, what is the error? It says, um, let me see. It says, uh, well, it doesn't know what ASOC is. Uh, I mean, we are not getting an interesting error because it should have said ASOC is unknown or something like that. But it's just complaining yeah. some some gibberish. Um, now, what does it mean? What does it mean when the arrows to the left? Does that mean? Uh, I mean, how did? Oh, let me look at the definition of uh, associative yeah, again. Absolutely. Um, okay. Does, does 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 the left just mean like apply it in the reverse direction? Absolutely. So so rewrite is basically uh, substitution along equality. So this R W mm -hmm. is short for rewrite. And it always comes with a direction, right? Because link cannot foresee which one you're you're going to, to use, which direction. So you have to tell to it, like you want to go from left to right or right to left. In this case, you're going from right to left. So so we are doing backward rewrite essentially. Uh, there is um, there is a sort of rewrite which doesn't like. I think like there is simp which simplifies. Um, okay, it's. Not simple only, maybe, or maybe symmetry, right? And do I need to provide arrows here? No, I think I'm afraid we have to provide the, the arrows. Uh, uh, so, so that's. Uh, yeah, so just going back to the definition of associative, right? right? So we have, yes. you, you define your terms. Uh, it's going to the hmm. associative part. Let, let's go back to that definition again that you programmed in. Right. 
So we have, uh, we, we have, okay, we define the terms. We have F and G and H, right? And then we have the <clears> first <throat> form is the same as the second form, right? And then right. the left side would say the second, is if you're starting from the second form, go back to the first form, essentially. Exactly. So we exactly. can do this with any kind of definition. Okay, I got it. I got it. Uh, right. As, as, long, as, as, as long as you provide the category structure, then ASOC becomes available, right? And, and here, mm -hmm. for example, when we look at H, uh, in H, you have F and G first composed, and then the result is composed with X. So what I yeah. want to do is I want to compose X and F first, and then compose it with G. And yeah. uh, reverse of ASOC axiom or ASOC equality exactly uh, gives you that. So, so if you yeah. like, we can do this I in, in steps. Yeah. Uh, so so, so normally rewrite one, basically rewrites everything to the uh, right. However, you can have the left arrow to rewrite everything to the left. So when you have a definition of this is equal to that, you can either say, okay, I have this form already. Give me this new form, right? That's just reading it exactly. forward. But you can also read it backwards and say, oh, well, I have the second form. Give me back the first form. Right. Okay, now right, I understand right. what that is. Um, thank exactly. you very much. Uh, no problem at all. So I want to like maybe mention this new tactic. So what is... So Lean has many facets. One of the facets is uh, developing automation tactics so that simple proof, simple logical proofs such as this can be automated for us, right? So one tactic that has been relatively recently developed is this ESOP tactic, uh, which does like uh, automatic, uh, uh, so it's automatic search for expressions essentially. Um, so if I do ESOP cat, you can see that uh, it proved it, right? It proved the fact that monomorphism, composition of monomorphism is monomorphism. And if I ask how it solves it by question mark, it says, you know, like do this. And actually the first step is not even necessary. So it really generated a proof for me. Um, so this is useful many times when we want to do uh, this in connection, uh, also with com combination with other, we have a bunch of interesting automation tactics which are especially good for category theory when you want to do, for example, uh, automated diagram chasing and those sort of things. Um, so, so one of the advantage of doing things in a proof assistant, especially when it comes to category theory, is the automation tactics. And uh, you know, there is uh, there is uh, uh, there, there are people who 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 are developing more automation tactics, and I think this is a, a very interesting future for for proof assistants, especially for for Lean. Um, okay, and, so and just 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 ask a quick question on that that these association mm -hmm. tactics are basically part of that Mathlib library. So that we uh, imported exactly. So so uh, so this uh, as associativity terms and unitality terms, which are part of category structure, uh, comes because I imported a bunch of things from from uh, Lean. For example, I imported unit lemma, which in turn mm -hmm. imports uh, category theory. So uh, and, and the imports are transitive, so uh, categories are available. Mm -hmm. So these are kind of like, uh, pr in a way, these libraries are essentially like, okay, I have prepackaged proofs, so I can just say this follows you in Ada lemma, right? And then it can just put all the steps that that it would do if it, if, it, if everything follows correctly. Right. This I mean, is, so so this. I mean, I'm just trying to understand this whole programming concept because this is the first I've heard of proof. Uh, things, but this is really the first time I've really taken a deep dive in one. So that that's so, the essential idea is that we create these proofs and then we can use those as libraries for other proofs. Uh, absolutely. And that's so, what these strategies so, are about? Exactly. So so the tactics or okay. strategies are, are using a bunch of uh, knowledge or, or terms in t of types. In this case, associativity is a term of a type, which is equality, right? It's a witness for the equality mm -hmm. of two things. And then you're using that witness, which is part of the data of category. So that's provided to you automatically uh, to, to do substitution along that. Um, mm -hmm. But if you want to get a more feel for, for how in general, not just category theory, but uh, how this sort of programming is done, um, I would really recommend this uh, as a first step, the natural number game in Lean, uh, if you have not heard of it before. Uh, so just, just you know, you can Google natural number game in Lean 4 and then you do have a, you, you get a, like a 
uh, a game which is visual and then there are levels and you can go from uh, you know uh, one level to the other and once you get more advanced in one level uh, there are certain tactics that become open to to use uh, essentially so it's it's very interactive and and i think like many people start with, with natural number game to just get a sense of how one can prove in league thanks um right so that as as we just so uh we can prove things in lean but the system is quite rigid because i was just struggling with bracketing right i mean you have to get the right order of bracketing um uh, and and there are many other finickiness and the system is quite unforgiving nonetheless uh there has been a lot of category theory being done in lean um so so here's a sample list sort of uh, uh so you can see like uh, we have enriched categories we have abelian categories uh uh, we have triangulated categories. Uh, condensed mathematics, for example, was uh, essentially started by a challenge that uh, Peter Schultz put the link community. So he had this um, uh, a theorem in condensed mathematics, uh, uh, which later became the project known as liquid tensor experiment. And so that's uh, around three years ago, I think. And um, so, so people got together and developed condensed mathematics, but now, uh, so there's more condensed mathematics beyond the liquid tensor experiment. Uh, so we have two categories, by categories. Uh, there's a lot of category theory for algebraic geometry. Uh, uh, and algebraic geometry has been a big push for, for category theory in, in, in Lean. Um, and, and something that is not here, but I've been uh, working last two months was uh, fiber categories. Uh, so, Today I want to talk about uh, I, I want to talk about fiber categories uh, and and there is a reason that it's not here uh, and it's it has to do with the dependent type theory of lean and especially when it comes to idea of like fiber categories which does use equality of objects and sometimes equality of functors these are the kind of things that are the most sort of annoying part of dependent type theory essentially so I want to get to this part. Um, so, but before doing that, maybe just last slide on categories is, um, so some of the features of, of category theory uh, in, in Lean is that uh, there, there is a distinction between uh, existence versus mere existence. So when we talk about like the concept of limit or co-limit in category, um, for example, we want to specify uh, so a limit means like there is a universal like limit cone for that diagram, right? Uh, or sometimes we want to say this is the canonical limit. So so in that case we want to specify what the, the cone is and what the the universal cone is essentially. Um, and and these are like implemented differently. Um, then there is the issue size issues, which is like uh, how large your categories are. I mean there is. Um, uh, so, so, and and I mentioned like there is this idea of polymorphism, and in fact here we have uh, our polymorphism is doubly uh, polymorphic, meaning that there is a size, uh, there is a universe for for type of objects, and there is a universe for type of morphisms, and we don't specify any of these things, and for the most part it it just works, like meaning that a lean by itself will figure out the correct sizes, so that we don't have to specify these things. Um, um, right, and then maybe uh, the most exciting part is uh, the automation tactics. I mentioned the tactic ESOP. This was developed by Yanis Limperg, uh, and it's uh, I, I use it a lot, and, and it's it's quite fun um, because it it takes care of not not always, but like lots of times, um, lots of like boring proofs in category theory, which are basically diagram chase, are are. Uh, ASAP takes care of those. Okay. Um, so, um, so about fiber categories uh, specifically, uh, as I mentioned, like there are issues with equality of objects and equality of morphisms. Um, and uh, I want to sort of maybe mention this by an example. Um, So wherever we can replace a concept, 
uh, sort of use of equality of objects in the concept by isomorphisms, there, there will be no problem in Lee because isomorphisms are, are defined properly and, and there, there will be no issue. But the fact that uh, categories are implemented dependently means that whenever our concepts depends on equality of objects, like for example, the notion of vibration, growth and vibration, uh, the standard definition uses equality of objects. And uh, we can replace those equalities with isomorphisms, and then you arrive at the notion of uh, the notion of a street vibration or weak chorotonic vibrations, um, which actually do have some nice properties. But chorotonic vibrations are more more used in in categorical logic, or if you do like uh, sort of like um, you know um, relative topos theory or in algebraic geometry. So at some point we have to deal with uh, equality of objects in category theory. Um, equality of factors is even worse, but I don't want to talk about it right now. Maybe we get to that later. So here's an example. Um, so if we want to talk about the notion of vibration of categories, uh, we have to say, uh, so, okay, I have, I have two categories, C and E, um, and then I have a functor from E to C, so that's P. Um, so I have to say, if I take two ob objects in the base, so I and J and a morphism between them, F, I want to see, or I want to define the lifts of morphism F. So they will be morphisms in E uh, such that they live over F. Uh, that means P takes those morphisms to F. So um, let's say that we want to specify the data of such lifts, right? So I have to say, well, if I fix a morphism from I, I to J in the base category C, I have a source object in the fiber of uh, I, the domain, and I have uh, an object target, in this case TGT, in the fiber over the codomain J. And I want to say, define the type or the space of morphisms from source to target, which live over F. Um, I hope this is clear, but uh, if it's not, then I'm happy to also draw a picture that, that demonstrates this idea. Uh, I, unfortunately, I would, I, guess... I would like the picture. Please. Okay, so, so uh, okay, great. So that might take a little bit of time for me to set my iPad, but I think at this point it's worth uh, having a picture. So let me see. Hmm. Are you going to log in with your iPad as another thing? I should make that um, post, or, or, or are you just going to somehow do it from you? So I, I'm using Keynote um, on uh, for my presentation, and usually I could write on uh, my Keynote slides from my iPad. Uh, but it says now starting slideshow, and it's taking forever to start that. Uh, so let me try again. I think it would be interesting to, to have uh, to have a picture. Okay, I, I think I'm getting somewhere. Uh, okay. So we are, so let me try and you tell me whether you can see anything or not. Uh, Do you see anything uh, on your side when I'm writing no, something? No, no, not, nothing at all. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Uh, it might take a bit of time for for, for it to sync. So uh, now, there's also okay. a thing I noticed that um, the yeah. Okay, fine. Never mind. 
I thought it didn't extend mm-hmm. to the bottom, but that was just because of my bar, so that's not a never mind. Oh, okay. Uh, see. Yes. Now I okay. see okay. That the diagram. Yes. Yeah, so yes. there's a. Yes. Thanks. So there's a delay. Sorry for, for like it should have been faster, but uh, uh, at least we have it now. Okay. Um, okay. So so this is the day shot that I start from. Like I have a category E, I have a category C, I have a functor P between them. I have a morphism F from I to J in the base. So that's I call C the base essentially. And then I have two objects in E source, uh, which so I have this notation like source lives over i. That means like p of source is going to be equal to i, right? And then p of target is going to be equal to j. And now I want to define a type or space of all possible morphisms from source to target, which live over f. That means p of those morphisms is going to be equal to f. Um, so, and this is in lean, uh, so the, the code snippet on the top that you see, it's going to implement the type of all lifts of F from source to target. So in particular, it includes two things. It includes a harm, which is a morphism from source to target in E. And then this, um, axiom or, uh, yeah, condition that says P applied to harm is equal to B going to be equal to F. Now, if I write this, actually link complaints, and this is the error message that we get. I mean, this sort of like innocuous thing leads to an error, which the error reads uh, that, you know, F has a different type than P dot map of harm. Because uh, F actually goes from I to J, whereas P dot map of harm goes from P of source to P of target, right? So, so already, although P of source is equal to, to I, but you know, the type from P source to P target is different from the type I to J. So therefore, um, F has a different type than P of harm. And if two terms have different types, they can never be equal. We can talk only about equality of terms in a given type, like in a fixed type. Um, so, so we get, we get the type problem, and this essentially comes from the dependent implementation of categories. Uh, so, uh, b- because morphisms depend now, the type of morphism depends on the object. So, how do we solve this problem? So, so I hope that the problem is clear to to everybody. Uh, if it's not, then I can elaborate further. Um, so to solve this problem, we can use induction uh, of, so the type of equality is defined as an inductive type. So when we write X equals to Y, that's an inductive type. And then we write P is an evidence that X equals to Y. That means P is a term of that inductive type. So uh, we can use the recursion of this inductive type to get from a witness that X equals to Y, a morphism from X to Y. And the way that we do this is basically, so our goal is to construct a morphism from X to Y. What we can do is to replace Y by x, because y and x are equal, right? So we just do a rewrite or substitution along p. And then we say, okay, what is a morphism from x to x? Well, that's going to be identity. So this term eq to harm is a function that, you know, whenever you have two equal objects, it gives you an identity morphism between them. And now the problem that we had is going to be solved by using this eq to harm. So if you look at this modified definition of lifts or base lifts, uh, we still have that harm that goes from source to target, but now we have this EQ to harm business going on. Um, And maybe here also a picture would help. 
Um, so let me try to write it with a bit of delay, possibly. Um, So I do have some source and some targets. Um, Okay, um, yeah, I'm not sure if it's appearing. Um, right, okay. There we got it, we got it. So, um, so I have this, let's say that I have a term of this base lift. That means it will be a morphism G from source to target, which lives over F. So, uh, now, if you look at P of G, P of G is going from P of source to P of target, whereas F is going from I to J. So uh, although P of source is equal to I, but P, and P of target is equal to J because you know source and target are in the fibers, nonetheless, uh, the hum types are going to be different. The hum type from I to J and P source to P target. And therefore, we cannot just say P G is equal to F. But if we compose, pre-compose F with eq to hum from p of source to i, which we get because p of source is equal to i, that's going to be equal to post composition of p of g and eq hum that we get from equality of p of target and j. So, uh, so that's one way to, to, to write uh, what it means for g to live over f. Um, and then once we do that, we can have a notation telling, you know, like, uh, when I write x bracket f to y, treat that as a lift of f from x to y, essentially. Uh, and essentially, when you provide such a term, like uh, then it means it has two things, right? It has a harm, and it has this condition over. OK. And once we define this, uh, our business of lifts, we can compose two lifts. So here, if I have a lift G over F and G prime over F prime, then I should be able to get a lift over the composition of F and F prime. And again, because we are providing a lift, we have to provide two pieces of data. We have to provide the morphisms in the, the top category. So that's going to be G dot hum composed with G prime dot hum. And then we have to prove that condition or the over condition, right? That this g dot hum composed with g prime dot hum lives over f composed with f prime. And then there is some 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 proof here. It's using some you know some some stuff associativity in some condition. Um, however, as you may guess, this composition is not going to be associative anymore. Um, Simply because if you look at bracketing of G1, G2 composed with G3, that morphism is going to live over F1 composed with F2, then composed with F3. Whereas the right-hand side, which is G2 composed with G3 and then pre-composed with G1, is going to live over a different bracketing of Fi's. Uh, although the, those bracketing of Fi's are going to be equal by associativity, but these two terms, which Lin is complaining about, the terms com uh, composing Gs, are going to live in two different types. And this is the error message that you get, right? That Lin says, even the statement of this associativity doesn't make sense. It's complaining these two terms are living in two different types. Um, so this was one of the, uh, so when I mentioned like uh, independent setting, equality can be a bit uh, nuisance. Uh, that, that's, that's one of the examples. So therefore we get some associativity up to uh, casting along equalities. So it's going to be a little bit more involved. And this leads to 
uh, some well-known structure called displayed categories. So think of displayed categories as like categories, except that the axioms of associativity and unitality are up to some casting. Um, so I'm not sure if you can read all of the, uh, the, the last uh, uh, line, but let me focus on the first line of the class display, which is ID comp cast, right? So what that says is if I compose identity with G, that's not going to be exactly G because now these two lifts are over two different morphisms in the base. So the left one is over the composition of identity and F, whereas the right-hand side, just G is over F. And therefore we have to do this, uh, that black triangle is basically casting. So that casting says, uh, if you have two terms, which are in two different types, but over the same, you know, over, over morphisms, which are equal in the base, then you can use equality in the base to cast uh, a term to, to, to have a different, to have the correct type. Um, and, and essentially casting is also defined by uh, recursion of equality type. So casting is essentially a substitution. Um, so, so why, so, one way to do fiber categories is to actually use this structure of displayed categories. Uh, what essentially displayed categories are, are packaging up this, uh, you know, associativity and unitality up to casting, which we get from uh, lifts of functors. So they are prominent in the setup of uh, formalization uh, when you have a dependent sort of formalization, especially displayed categories are uh, if, if your categories are simple, you know, simple, simply typed, you will not need this. But since our categories are dependently typed, uh, when we want to talk about lifts of morphisms, then they naturally show up essentially as I hopefully demonstrated. Um, so let me just go a little bit forward and see how we can get two vibrations out of this. Um, so first of all, if, if you have a functor from you know, E to C, then uh, we have a family of fibers. So that's like um, you know, associated to every object C, the fiber of pre-image of C under the functor. And here essentially it's saying like the base lifts uh, that we previously defined form a display structure. Um, so the display structure has this harm over thing as the first field, which says, you know, uh, if, if you have a morphism from I to J, and F here is basically any, any family over, any type family over uh, objects of C. So F of I is just a type, right? And F of J is, is, is also a type. But these are sort of abstracting away the fiber functor, right? Um, so we can think of this F of I as fiber of, uh, a functor P. So this is P inverse of I. Um, so if you have sort of like a morphism from I to J, an element of fiber over I, element of fiber over J, then this hum over is essentially providing the type of base lifts, but more abstractly. So base lifts of over I to J. Um, and then you want to have like an identity base lift and a composition of base lifts. And these identity and compositions are not, uh, you know, uh, like uh, like you don't have unitality and associativity on the nodes, but there is some casting that makes sure like these things have the right type when you compare them. Um, so so here I'm essentially saying like you know this if you have a functor you get this display structure. And you might have different display structure that doesn't come from a functor, right? But but here we are saying like the hum over, uh, which is a field of display structure, is going to be provided by base lifts. Um, and now at a more abstract level of display structures, not just for functors, but for all display structure, we can say what it means for uh, 
a lift G over F to be Cartesian. So here it means uh, uh, like this has a universal property, which is for any morphism U K to I. So I is the domain of F. Um, if I compose, if I have a lift G prime over composition of U and F, then I have a unique morphism from uh, K from Z to X over U, such that you know when when you compose it, compose G with K, you get G, uh, G prime. Again, I think here maybe a picture is is helpful. Uh, so if if you have not seen the notion of Cartesian morphism before, I think it's worth having a picture. Um, so let me try to make a picture of this as well. Okay, uh, let me see if the picture now is appearing. Um, okay, so so we are saying like that blue morphism G over F is Cartesian. If for any morphism U uh, to the domain of F and any morphism G prime over composition of U and F, there's a unique morphism K from Z to X that composes the G to G prime and lives over U. So uh, using this, you know, uh, display kind of infrastructure, uh, we can, you know, nicely package all this uh, data of like uh, this this uh, universality data essentially. Um, simply because every time that I want to say like, you know, uh, that morphism overlives some morphism in the base, I, I have this notation that supports it. So, so here's a very concise definition of Cartesian. And uh, we can say like, um, uh, we can define vibrations essentially. So um, I, I would like to draw your attention to notion of cloven vibration. So that's going to be the fourth uh, structure from the top. So this class cloven vibration associates to uh, every function from E to C, uh, a function lift, right? That says, if I have a morphism F from C to D and the fiber over the domain of this, the codomain of this morphism, so that's Y, then I'm going to get a, a Cartesian lift of um, F that ends at Y. Um, so, uh, so it took us more time than just a sort of like a standard uh, definition of Cartesian vibrations to get here, simply because of the complexity of dealing with dependent implement implementation of categories. But once we get here, uh, the repository that I shared at the beginning of the talk actually develops the whole, I mean, the basics of theory of growth ending vibrations. So for example, uh, in there you can find the proof that, you know, uh, composition of Grothendieck vibrations, a Grothendieck vibration, for example, or that every Grothendieck vibration you can associate an indexed functor, uh, which gives the whole transport um, transport functors essentially, and then uh, you can prove like the Grothendieck construction, for example. It's a there's a proof there that uh, it's a formal proof that Grothendieck construction gives you a Grothendieck vibration. Um, and hopefully the uh, the plan that I have is basically I, I would like to develop a, a theory of Grothendieck vibrations more in the direction of uh, categorical logic, um, so that we have a semantics of dependent type theory using Grothendieck vibrations in link. So that's uh, has not been developed. It's it's a work in progress. Uh, but given now the infrastructure of vibrations, uh, ho hopefully uh, that, that's a plan.
So here are some references at the end. Uh, I, I forgot to add a natural number game to this, but why not? I, I show you natural number game. Uh, so, so for those of you who want to. Uh, Uh, maybe have more experience with lean as a first experience. Uh, so natural number game. Lean four. Um, so there is this link. Uh, it's a project at uh, Heinrich Heine University, uh, University in, uh, in Dusseldorf. Uh, and uh, can you actually uh, see what I'm sharing on uh, as a web page I'm sharing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. That's good, good, good. So, so the, the first case is natural number game, and then you can you can play different games, set theory or logic. Uh, uh, so, but I would say like natural number game is the, and and then you can choose different levels for yourself. You can play relaxed or regular or, so regular is going to be more strict. It doesn't allow you to jump to levels, you know, but like if I click on relax and I can like start from tutorial world or go to addition world, you know, uh, and if I click here, then, you know, you start a level and then there's some some hints and some comments where to start, what these tactics are and how we can use them. And so when I click a start, uh, like this is, I'm at the first level of like, addition of natural numbers, right? And here, like, I want to prove, like, uh, for any natural number n, 0 plus n is equal to n, right? And uh, hopefully, if, if you have had course in introduction, like, uh, introduction to proof course, you have seen induction. And uh, here, here we want to prove for any natural number this is the case. So we, we want to induct over natural numbers. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so I can see, like, here, I can only use three tactics because the other tactics are locked, so I cannot use them, right? So I can use either rewrite, refill, or induction. So, okay, let me just write refill. And if, if you read the hints on the left-hand side, it tells us like refill proves things which are definitionally equal, right? These are the kind of things you don't really need to like, like two plus two equals four, for example, is definitionally equal because once you unfold definition, definition of plus and definition of two, then you can see like this, this becomes successor of successor of successor of successor of one, zero, and same with four. So they are, you know, they compute to the same thing. So those are things that Refel can prove. Whereas here you actually have to, you know, use induction. So you have to do some work. So hopefully Refel is not going to work. And you see, you get you get an error here and says this is not definitionally equal to n. Um, and and hopefully if you read the hints on the left hand side, then you can play this game and, and that would be a good introduction to, to Lee. Uh, but let me go back to my slides now. Um, okay. Um, how am I doing on the time? Is it good? Uh, I'm sorry, we're gonna run out of time in about five minutes from Zoom. Okay. Uh, I think I'm I, I'm going to stop at this point, and if, if there are questions, then I'm happy happy to answer. I I do have one more question, um, just a quick one. Yeah, you had, you mentioned here uh, some lectures that you made. Do you have uh, are there videos available of the lectures, or are they just the uh, the notes? Uh, so there are some uh, this course um, that I taught is introduction to proofs. Uh, I think if you click on this link. Maybe, maybe I haven't provided the link, but there are some YouTube videos of these lectures available on YouTube. Uh, so I think if you go to introduction, GitHub introduction to proof.com, then you get uh, the list of s some of the videos that I, I have. Uh, uh, it, it, I, I think it's called intro to proof.com, github.intro to proof.com or something like that. Um, okay, but, but I'll I'm, do I'm, search. I'm, so they are, they are not like you know very organized based. So it's like I think like uh, you can find some. Um, so I did like last last four lectures of one of the iteration of these courses in fall two thousand and twenty two. I actually taught like basics of category theory to like undergraduates who have not seen like even algebra before that, and it went well actually. Um, 
and, and some of the videos are on YouTube, so you can watch those if you like. I have a more general sort of question. I was just because the last time I had, you know, had much had anything to do with lean community and the like was about five years ago. And I know, you know, two of the projects that they were currently doing then was there were some people involved with um, trying to get the homotopy type theory book into lean. And there was also the big, you know, formal abstract project by Peter's head, by Hales and other people about trying to ambitiously get on that. So I was just wondering, you know, since you're currently involved with lean, how are, what is sort of the overall, just to go, are, are any of those active or are there successors of them or what is the situation nowadays? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, so, I mean, I think like to, uh, to see the most, like, I mean, I don't have overall idea because it's just the community has got too large and like, if, if you like jo join this, I mean, you are part of this, you perhaps know this Lean Zulip chat, which I put in, in the references. Mm -hmm. This is like a Zulip chat, like the community is there. And uh, if, if, if you're if you a beginner, then you can come and like ask your questions and everybody is so patient and try to, to answer questions, but also people develop projects and collaborate on this. And I mean, there are just so many streams and like there are you know tens of thousands of people over there. And I don't have an overall view of all the projects, but Specifically to, to what you said about how much we try here in Lean, I know that uh, in Lean 2 and Lean 3, there was a project to develop how much we try theory into Lean Core. So a sort of support for how much we try theory in Lean. Um, in Lean 4, I believe that project is, uh, is not maintained anymore. So it's not part of Lean 4. Mm -hmm. uh, so currently, we don't have how much of a type theory. I have some ideas how to do this, but it, it will, you know, take a good amount of work to, to do this. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and and the, the, just just to make sure, like uh, uh, the the distinctions are are clear. So how much of a type theory is based on intention of type theory? That means if you have e equality of things, are uh, so two things can be equal in more than one way. Um, and you can have like a homotopy type of equalities of things. Whereas in Lean, we have extensional type theory. So that makes life simpler in a way, because if two things are equal, they are going to be equal in at most one way. Mm -hmm. And because the equality is in this sense, like propositional truncated, um, um, like, you know, things like rewriting and substitution is going to be just done much, much more simply. Whereas in homotopy type theory, you need this whole business of transport and, uh, <laughs> And induction over, and the induction of the identity type is way more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so that's about how much of type theory. I didn't quite understand the other project you mentioned. So, so I think a you mentioned formal abstracts project. This was by Tom Hales and a lot of other people. I think many of them in Pittsburgh, some who I interacted right. with, where they were sort of more ambitiously trying to, you know, get all of math into lean, or at least statement or if not the whole proofs at least they take statements of all you know different theorems in the literature so they may by formal abstract with a paper well I, the abstract tells you what it is but let me say put statements of all the theorems of it formalized in there so i could then have a you know, big library of all mathematics to use i see i haven't followed that project closely but i know that's ongoing uh, just based on you know uh, sometimes you know looking into uh, some of the streams on Sulip, but I think that's 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 alive and, and it's going on. Okay, that's, yeah, thank you. Hey, Sina, thank no you problem. very much. I, we're going to run, run out of time in about a minute. Uh, yeah, thanks for the questions and the wonderful talk and everything. Hold on, thanks. somebody from the chat has something to say. Hold on. To be clear, your goal is not a co to compute with fiber categories definitionally, such that magically those transport along equality disappear, but only to prove theorems. Exactly. Hmm. To only prove theorems. And and hopefully, I mean, it's not a, it's not a magic. Like you, 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 you get as much as you put into it. Uh, but sometimes if you're lucky, this automation tactics like ESOP uh, reduce the amount of work that you would need to do if you just wrote pen and paper. On the other hand, there are other parts that you have to do a lot more, such as I just demonstrated. Like you cannot write the usual definition of uh, growthing vibration. Uh, it's not hard to write down, but now you need this whole business of like casting along equalities and display categories and 
which comes out of this dependent implementation. So I think like uh, it's it's just a different way of doing things. Very nice, very nice. Anyway, Sina, thank you very much. Very nice, very entertaining, very very enjoyable, very interesting. Uh, you're very welcome. Yeah. It's a uh, it's different than usual, but it was very very clear. Anyways, thank you very much. Um, we're not going to meet again for another three weeks. In three weeks, Elias Cooper is going to speak in person in the Graduate Center, so I hope to see whoever can be there. Um, and I'll put up the video afterwards. Sina, keep in touch. Take care. Okay, okay.